Jeez. Okay, we'll start with this per tweet from Michael Benson. Eddie Hearn has revealed that last month he was in talks to make Manny Pacquiao versus Amir Khan and had the fight ready to go in Dubai. But Pacquiao opted to retire instead. It seems that communications were still fragmented, still immaterial, right up until the end of Manny Pacquiao's boxing career. Because he very recently retired. Strange to hear that... Not that long ago, Eddie Hearn was working on an Amir Khan versus Manny Pacquiao fight set to go down in Dubai when we thought Amir Khan was supposed to be facing Kel Brock. We thought that was underway. We thought that was underway last month and sometime before that. I mean, there have been rumors and rumblings and some effort to bring this long overdue domestic grudge match into fruition. And it still hasn't happened. The fight still ain't done. Eddie Hearn has said that he's pulled out of talks to do Amir Khan versus Kel Brock on his own. This fight is a busted flush. Neither of them want it anymore, especially Kel. If they can get the money and get you to pay for it, I'm sure people will. But we're out of that fight. That's not surprising. Several weeks ago, I suspected that... Kel Brock and Amir Khan, they would have liked for Eddie to do the fight, but Eddie himself, he had a wavering commitment to it. It's not that the fight can't do good business. You build a card around it, it can. Few domestic level fights, one or two familiar faces, and Amir Khan versus Kel Brock, as long overdue as it might be, could still sell tickets, could still generate interest. So long as everybody's reasonable. And therein lies the dilemma. Amir Khan has revealed Kel Brock negotiations are currently at a sticking point over the weight. Kel said he would fight at 147 pounds. I agreed. Now Kel wants 149 pounds. Then he wants 149.5 pounds. Is he even serious about wanting the fight? Lots rich coming from you, Amir. Amir Khan, who admitted to putting off this fight for years to spite Kel Brock. That was his way of... That's how he wanted to stick it to Kel. By not fighting him. By not giving him the satisfaction. Not giving him the satisfaction at all. Amir Khan admitted this some time ago and we talked about it here on the channel. Uh, Amir Khan is questioning Kel Brock's commitment to the fight, but... Eddie just said you were in negotiations to fight Manny last month. And had Manny Pacquiao not retired and they got that fight over the line, where would that have left the Kel Brock fight? That would have been yet another instance where Amir Khan left Kel Brock holding the bag. It doesn't seem like Amir was all that committed to the fight either. I mean, not if you were negotiating to fight Manny Pacquiao in Dubai as recent as last month. Eddie says he had the fight ready to go. It was Manny retiring that brought things to a screeching halt. Had he not retired, you would have fought him, and you wouldn't have fought Kel Brock. I don't really think either of these two guys are committed to this fight. Moreover, I don't think that these two guys are really committed to the sport of boxing anymore. At this point, they're just looking to cash out. One last hoorah, one last payday, one last big payday, and, and that creates problems. It's not that the fight can't happen, and it's not that the fight can't do good business, but the aforementioned parties have to be reasonable. And these guys, they ain't looking to just make reasonable money, walk into a reasonable situation. They're going to drive a hard bargain, and that's going to make the fight, at least for Eddie, more trouble than it's worth. Maybe the fight can happen on Sky Sports. Sky needs the content. They could use two familiar faces like Amir Khan and Kel Brock to garner some viewership, decorate the card with their boxers from Wasserman, their boxers from Boxer, their stable of fighters. But once again, Amir Khan and Kel Brock, they have to be reasonable. I'm of the opinion that the kind of money they want to make for this fight, big cash guarantees are the kind of guarantees that would see Sky Sports having to build this thing as a pay-per-view. It's different if Eddie does it because they'll see it as part of their own subscription in the UK. But Eddie ain't doing it. And if Sky Sports were to try to pick the fight up, given what Kel might want, what Amir might want, yeah, they might try to bill it as a pay-per-view. And it is a bit of a tough sell. It's a fight that's past the sell-by date. A lot of people have already come to terms with the fight having not happened sooner. When these two guys were in their prime, and now that they're both past their prime, if the fight don't happen, at this point, nobody's gonna lose sleep over it. And just in keeping with the theme of all things Matchroom and Sky Sports, that rivalry that's brewing between them and their stables of fighters, London, England, Florian Marcou returns to the boxer ring Saturday, November 20th, to fight at the SSE Arena, Wembley, which will be televised live and exclusively on Sky Sports. Ahead of that contest, the first 2021 bout of his multi-fight commitment with boxer, the Albanian King, is excited to be back on Sky Sports and has shifted his focus entirely to pursuing a world 
Title, Sky is the best. I've seen Sky since I was a little kid. When I was watching big fights in Greece, and now I'm on this platform, when I think about that, it's like a dream, he says. By the end of next year, I hope to have a major title belt around my waist. I think I'm about four good fights away from that. Four fights from top fighters, good names. Nigel Benn's son, Connor Benn, doesn't want me anywhere near him, so he is not my target. And I think that's pretty self-explanatory, isn't it? As far as, why did Florian Marku decide to migrate from Matchroom over to Sky? Guess it's because he feels that Conor Ben fight, that ain't gonna happen, so he's gonna set his sights on something else. He's gonna set his sights on becoming a world champion. You know, I thought Matchroom was gonna do that fight. It seemed sensical enough, sensible enough, a battle of the unbeatens. I'm gonna be honest about this, I'm not gonna pull any punches. I'm getting the sense that if Conor Ben wanted that fight, then that fight would have happened. That would have been the next fight. But that fight's not happening, is it? A lot of bright ideas about who Conor Ben's gonna fight next. My previous segment, we talked about how things aren't working out between Amir Khan and Kel Brock. And if things continue to go that way, either one of them would be an ideal opponent for Conor Ben, who's still stepping up in class, fight by fight, improving on his quality of competition. Two former world champions in Amir Khan or Kel Brock would be ideal for him in this situation, though I've no doubts they'd want to make a pretty penny for taking on a young upstart like Conor Ben. They're gonna want a lot of money. That could cause a lot of problems. Now that Eddie wants to match Conor Ben against Amir Khan, he also wants to match him against Adrian Bronier, though that was never a realistic proposition. Adrian Bronier himself seems to be pursuing an Omar Figueroa fight. Who wants to see that shit? I don't. Omar Figueroa is coming off of two back-to-back -back losses. He Lost to Jordanis Ugas in 2019, sat out all of 2020, and earlier this year, he lost again to Abel Ramos. And this is who Adrian Brown is calling out. Gives you a good idea of what kind of headspace he's in and uh, what kind of fight he's looking for. No. Adrian Broner versus Conor Ben, I was never holding my breath for that to happen. Uh, David Avenesian, that's a name that was thrown around in some circles, though that's not realistic anymore, not as far as I'm concerned, because David Avenesian, you know, he dismantled Josh Kelly. He did, he then unbeaten Josh Kelly. And if that's not bad enough, you know, the risks associated with the fight, David's last fight was on Sky. He's with Boxer now. He's over there with Florian Marco. What we might end up seeing is a fight between those two guys somewhere down the line, Avenesian versus Marco, before we see Avenesian versus Ben. Avenesian, who was in action not but, what, a week ago against Liam Taylor, who he stopped in two rounds? That he's gonna have to find somebody else for Connor to fight. Because with Florian Marco and David Avenesian having migrated to Sky Sports, I get the sense that their teams, their respective teams, have other plans for them. Not sure those fights are even available to Connor anymore. Uh, uh, we'll see if they can make something happen with either Amir Khan or Kel Brock if things don't work out between them. No chance of a Broner fight happening. I don't know. Maybe they can call up Chris Algieri. He's a former world champion. Maybe Chris Van Hidden. Somebody experienced enough. More experienced than Connor that they can actually make him work for it, work for the W, but not somebody who's so experienced and so on the up and up that young Connor might be in over his head. They're gonna have to get creative with the matchmaking. Because they plan on adding him to the Parker versus Chisora sequel, their rematch, they plan on adding young Connor to that card's undercard. And, you know, clock's ticking. They're gonna have to find somebody for this guy to fight. And options are becoming scarce. The right ones, anyway. In other news, per a tweet from Probellum, Richard Schaefer's new endeavor, Purse bids one for Casemiro versus Paul Butler for the WBO Bantamweight title. We talked about this here on the channel, how the WBO ordered this fight. Purse bid went down, and apparently Probellum Place the winning bid. Not sure who else bid on this fight, if anyone else did. I thought that this fight would take place on the shores of PBC's Isolation Island, and apparently not. For a tweet from Gustavo Olivieri of the WBO, the winning bid was just a little over $100,000. Modest amount of money, if I do say so myself. Then again, those bantamweights, they don't really get big prices. Like... The heavier guys do. Probellum's making a lot of moves. They've signed some very familiar faces and some not so familiar faces. We talked about that here on the channel, how they signed Badu Jack, Regis Prograrius. More recently, they signed multi-weight champion Ricky Burns, among several others. Some young up-and-coming hopefuls, upstarts. They're forming network relationships with different outfits around the world. The biggest being Wasserman Boxing. That's Kale, Nisei Sarlin, Sarlin Brothers, Sarlin Promotions. They're also partnering up with smaller 
other outfits, local ones like Sean Boxing over there in the Dominican Republic. Maravilla Box. That's Sergio Martinez's promotional company. Armington Box in Indonesia. Glozier Box down there in New Zealand. Universum Box in Deutschland. They're making a lot of moves. Though ultimately, the news we need to hear, the news we need to know is how exactly are fight fans supposed to see these cards by way of ProBellum and their network partners all around the world? What are they doing in terms of a digital platform, their own digital platform, because there was some mention of one? And until we get that information, for all these signings they're making, we still don't know where we're supposed to see these fights. How are we supposed to see these fights? You win a purse bid for Casemiro versus Butler, and that shows you've got some money to play. That's all well and good. Now, how the hell are we supposed to see the fight? Why isn't this fight happening on the shores of PBC's Isolation Island? I mean, that is where John Real Casemiro has been fighting. That's where his last fight took place. The fight with Guillermo Regandiao, a fight that almost nobody enjoyed, a fight that got a a lot of negative press. I mean, it reflected poorly on Rigo, it did, but it also reflected poorly on John Real Casemiro. Is that fight being a stinker? The reason that John Real Casemiro's next fight might happen someplace else? In a fight like that, I think it'll be hard to get television slots for the both of them. Because that fight and its aesthetic was an indictment on the both of them. You got one guy who won't stop moving around the ring. Won't engage. And another guy who can't pin him down long enough to let off some power shots, let off some meaningful punches. The fight made the both of those guys look bad as far as I'm concerned. And there were no winners in that fight, though John Real Casemiro... He was awarded the decision. There's still a lot left to the imagination when it comes to Pro Bellum, this newly formed promotional and media company. But the most relevant bit of information that we need is... How exactly are we supposed to see fights involving Pro Bellum's fighters and their network partners, their promotional partners, all around the world? On what platform will these fights take place? Because you went as far as bidding on this fight, and you won the purse bid, but we don't know where we're supposed to be able to see this. I'm sure that information will be made available shortly. And finally, per a tweet from Michael Benson, Bob Arum on where a potential Tyson Fury versus Dillian Veidt fight would take place, Vegas. Big fights belong here, sometimes in the UK, but US pay-per-view is robust. The travel ban will be lifted. 10,000 Brits would come over. It works better here than any place in the world. Yeah, right. 10,000 Brits wouldn't have to come over to Vegas if you staged the fight in the UK where both of Dillian Vite and Tyson Fury's core fans reside. I mean, it's not that they wouldn't come over, they would. And it's not that Bob Arum doesn't know what he's talking about, he does. He knows what's good for the goose is good for the gander, and he knows what's good for business. And for his business, which is based out of America, he'd prefer that the fight happen here because he stands to make more money from it. Though ultimately, the fight's overall value... That fight makes more money in the United Kingdom than the United States. But for Bob, Bob specifically, he makes more money if it happens here in the United States. And that's why he wants it here. Well, it's not a situation that can't be worked around. It can. This is a new age of boxing and perhaps the time of the fight, you know, maybe they could do it a little earlier to accommodate those Brits across the Atlantic Ocean, across the pond, stage it as a Sky Sports pay-per-view in the United Kingdom and perhaps a pay-per-view here in the United States, though I don't know how many Americans. Do you know how xenophobic these people are? When the Klitschko brothers took over the heavyweight division. And rain for something like, I don't know, man. Yeah. Decade, maybe? Yeah. As far as the Americans were concerned, heavyweight boxing was dead because we didn't have a predominant American heavyweight. It's not that the division died. It's not that there weren't fights. Good fights happened, and there were. It just didn't involve very many Americans. So if by some chance Tyson Fury makes it past Deontay Valder this weekend, and he goes on to fight Dilly and Vite in a domestic pay-per-view here stateside, two Brits... $80 a pop. Um, yeah, I don't know that the pay-per-view buys will be all that robust. Though I reiterate, Bob's stake in all of this, the reason he'd want it to go down in America is because he stands to benefit from it the most. The fight happening here as opposed to over there in the United Kingdom. He knows what's good for his business. And what's best for his outfit. I don't question Bob Arum's business savvy. After 50 years in this industry, the man knows what he's doing and he has staying power. That much is clear. I'm just telling you that if he's saying what he's saying... You gotta take it all with a grain of salt, guys. Old Bob, Uncle Bob added, the last time he was mandatory, he fought Povetkin and... Got knocked on his ass. I look for Valine to clearly beat White, so I'm not even taking it into consideration. That's right. In some ways, history is repeating itself. 
you know. Dillian Vaik was in a pole position to become the mandatory challenger ahead of the first Alexander Povetkin fight. And Alexander, he upset the apple cart. You guys all saw it. He knocked Dillian Vaik out. And Dillian, he won the rematch. He rebounded off the loss. Now he's about to fight Otto Valine. And it's a very similar situation. Though Otto ain't the same fighter that Povetkin is. And don't misunderstand me. It's not that Otto isn't a credible threat to Dillian. He is. But he's not the same threat that Alexander was. Alexander had a reputation for being a dangerous puncher, an explosive puncher, and a crafty pressure guy. Guy who's going to get close to you and let the fists fly. An Olympic gold medalist. With a robust body of work. It's a guy who's knocked out a lot of guys. And Otto, Otto just ain't got that same reputation. He certainly ain't got that same body of work. So while the Valine situation is an interesting situation, I'd say that the probability of Otto knocking out Dillian is a little lower. Did you guys see the Brazil fight? I don't want to fight. He did. He won a unanimous decision over the course of 12 rounds, though he didn't seem all that destructive a puncher in that fight. He didn't even seem like the same aggressive guy that mauled Tyson Fury and opened that cut up over his eye. I mean, he did do a lot more boxing than I expected him to. Look, it's safe to say he's not the same puncher that Povetkin was. And I'm not writing off his chances. I'm not writing him off for saying that Dillian Veidt can afford to overlook him, that this is somehow a walk in the park or a picnic. No, it's not a picnic, but this guy, he ain't got the same reputation that Alexander had, and he's shown that he's not the same kind of puncher that Alexander was. It is a different situation with its own uniqueness to it. I'll say I think this is a more winnable fight than the Povetkin fight was. I'll say that this fight does have its own element of danger, though the risks ahead of this fight, they're not in keeping with the same risks Dillian Veidt took with Povetkin, because Povetkin's a very crafty hooker that knows how to disguise his punches. I mean, he hit Dillian with a peach of an uppercut in a fight that Alexander was all but ready to lose. Well on his way to losing. Different fight, different fighter. I think about that.